And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Daryl James, who was recruited to join the secret space program and guaranteed a position as a pilot in the Solar Warden. After a miscommunication with a nine and a half foot tall reptilian, he was sent to the mines on the moon, which we're going to learn about and more. Daryl, thank you for joining me and welcome. Yes, thanks for, thank you for having me. Can we kind of start at the beginning, Daryl, and go with how did you get recruited in the first place? It was 2004 and I just got out of the battalion. I just got back from Iraq and I was in a Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 7. And then I was uh, re-enlisted and I was stationed in St. Morgan, England, a base called uh, JMF RAF St. Morgan, which stood for Joint Maritime Force and Royal Air Force working together, like U.S. Navy and the Royal Air Force working together. And um, it was a Monday and I was um, sent over to the quarter deck, which is like the lobby of the base. It's where you check in and out on leave. If you're going to a new command, it's, you know, and they have like the log books there and everything else and the watches are there. And I was sent into the underground base to escort some civilian workers from the corporation Siemens. And I worked in the garage, like outside of the underground base. I, di I didn't work in the underground base very often. And uh, the first, when we, there was a sliding glass door when you first walked in. And the first man, he said, he, there was a metal detector, it looked like. I found out later it was called the scanner. And he said, I'm not walking through that bloody thing. So, he walked around and I tried to walk around, but then there was a guard with like a green beret, English army. He had a rifle over his shoulder behind a stainless steel table. And he said, no, you walk through. So I looked at it. I just thought it was a, a metal detector and I walked through, you know, it had like rectangular sides, top, a little hump with a black and yellow caution tape. So you wouldn't trip over it. So I just walked through, I watched them fix a pump. And then that was the end of that day. And then I had a uh, 0 hundred to 4 a.m. watch, so 12 midnight to 4 watch at the quarter deck. And I saw Michael Aquino there. And Michael Aquino, I had seen him on Oprah before. He was like a Temple of Set. Uh, he started that. He's a colonel in the Army. Um, he rolls his eyebrows up like horns, so it's pretty easy to recognize. And I talked to him for a while, and he was looking at papers. And I think he was looking at, like, me, like, my files. I think he wanted to, like, see me in person. So I, 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 I talked to him and he kind of creeped me out and I just went, you know, on another round around the base. And then um, it was another, next Friday I had another 0 hundred to 4 a.m. watch, which doesn't happen very often. Usually only if you're like late for watch or you get in trouble that you have to do another, you know, watch like that on a Friday night. So I was just, just sitting down, you know, and the petty officer of the watch, he pointed at the computer monitor behind the desk. And it was like a picture of a stereotypical gray. And, um, you know, I, I said, what did you get that off the Internet? And he said, no, look. And next to that sliding glass door, there was like this big window that stopped like six inches from the ceiling, six inches from the floor. And there was like an office area behind it, like a table with chairs. And it was like a separate room. And uh, there was just like this gray behind it. I found out later they call them drones. And uh, it was kind of like light brown, light khaki brown, had a hue of pink about it big black eyes, you know, small mouth, no ears, had a fold of skin from like its tear ducts down to its cheekbones. And he said, do you mind if it comes in here? And I said, does it mind if I look at it? And he, he said, no, it doesn't mind. But then I heard it in my head. I heard it say, I don't mind. And it walked out of that room, walked out through the sliding glass door. Um, that same guard was behind it. And he had this silver pistol in his hand, it looked like to me. And I said, gun, 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 gun. I just got back from Iraq, so I thought it was a gun. And I stood up and I, you know, yelled gun. And uh, they all said it's not a gun. And the guard, he now had his rifle, like, at the ready, they call it. You know, no longer on his shoulder. It wasn't pointed at me, but he had it at the ready. And uh, so I realized that it was for me. You know, the, the rifle was for me, not for it. So I just sat back down. And there was, this, like, this junky Dell computer next to me, lit, like, sitting on the floor. And it was actually a, 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 a drill, like a polished silver drill. And it started taking it apart, like fast, like a machine. It didn't have to guide the bed in or anything. It was just hitting the screw every time. And it was catching it with the other hand. And so it did the side, did the back, did the other side. It slid the top off, popped out two gigs of RAM, reached up on the, t on the table that was in front of it, 
grab two more gigs, put them in, slid it back down. And then it, it kind of like flicked its wrist and was able to kind of like set the screws between its fingers every time, and just put it back together every time. And, you know, it, it hit right there every time. It was, it was like a machine. And, and um, it stood there for a while and it just like kind of looked at me. It just stood there. So I, I leaned to one side and it turned its head for me. I leaned it to the other, it turned its head. I looked at its hands, it moved its hands around. And its hands were like very long, like its palms were long and its fingers were extremely long and they're like, you know, long spindly fingers. And it kind of had to keep its hands in C shape when it walked and it walked kind of robotic when it walked. And uh, had five fingers though. Like people say they have three fingers. This one had five fingers. Um, you know, no nipples, no navel, no genitals. It was just like smooth. And uh, I got kind of bored with it and it walked away. Uh, yeah, so it walked back into the underground base. And then the um, petty officer of the watch, he said, do you think you could work around something like that? And I said, I guess. And he said, uh, you're smart. And I said, really? He goes, yeah, really smart. And I said, well, how smart? Like 140, 150 IQ. And he said, more like 190, 195. And he pointed at the computer monitor and there were like color coded lines that kind of like went up and down a little bit. And he said, see, you're the second smartest guy on base. And there was one right above me and I was right there. And then there was a gap and then there was like the rest of the people. And uh, he, I said, how do you know that? And he said, you see that? He also said things like, you smoke, but you don't have any clots. And he, he because uh, I used to smoke at the time, and he, and he goes, uh, it, but that's because you drink, because I drank at the time. And, and so when I asked him, you know, how do you know all this about me? He said, you see that machine you walked through when you first went to the quarter deck? I said, yeah. He said, that's a scanner. And it just can tell everything about you. It, it can tell if you do drugs. It can tell if you, you know, if you have any clots. It can tell your IQ. It just gives you, like, a full scan. And um, he said, do you have any hobbies? And I said, well, I used to play classical guitar. And he said, oh, they'll like that. And I said, what do you mean they? And he goes, well, there's Germans up there. He said, in the moon. And then he said, beyond. And uh, he said, with your scores, you're, you, you'll make, you know, you'll be an officer. So you'll, you'll have plenty of uh, time to practice guitar. And, you know, that was pretty much the end of that day. And I remember the whole time it was happening, I was like pinching myself. I, like when I was watching it take apart the computer, I was sitting down and like, you know, basically giving myself a blood blister. And he, he said, uh, do you think you're dreaming? And I said, no, I said, I want to have a mark on my body in case you, you know, erase my mind. So I'll remember this. And he said, oh, don't worry. You'll, you'll remember for now. And then, um, well, let me ask you this before you move yeah. on. They called these grays drones. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that they're basically like a biological robot? Yeah, they're like, yeah, a biological robot, but they kind of have a, uh, a shared consciousness is what I know about. And that's something else you learn in the programs is like, you know, consciousness is real, the soul, things like that. that that's like an actual real, you know, that, that that exists. And then these drones, they're all kind of, they're kind of like ants, you know, they kind of have the shared, like a hive mind. And uh, on the ships, they were used for like preventative maintenance and stuff. You would see them like running around the ship doing things, like repairing the ship, things like that. And that's what they're primary task is but um yeah then it was uh, so oh one of the guys came up to me out of the blue and he said hey what did you think you know the next day and um i said what do you mean and he said you know the uh big black eyes long spindly fingers kind of creepy looking and i said oh right yeah and, and he said uh he, he, you're the you're really smart you're the second smartest guy on base and i said I know. And he said, you know, the smartest is, and I said, no. And he said, the XO, which is the executive officer and the second in command of the base. And, uh, so yeah, then I talked to him and then on a Monday when I came back to work, I was in the garage, I was in like the lunch area and, uh, the XO came and he wanted to speak to me, which is strange because they'll usually call you to their office, but you know, they don't come to you. And he, he came to where I work and he asked if he could speak to me and I grabbed my hat and we started walking. And, um, at first it was small talk. And then he said, so what do you think? It's pretty amazing, huh? And I said, yes, yeah, talking about the drone. And, um, he said, how does it feel to have 195 IQ? And, you know, I, I said, you would know because you're the only smartest, smarter, you're the only person smarter than me on base. 
said he, he had over 200 IQ. And, uh, you know, he said, who told you? And I was like, oh, I, you know, I kind of like told on my friend without even realizing it. And I was like, ah. And I, I, I told him and I said, but it's OK. Everybody knows because everybody came up to me and they're all like, you know, they all started saying, why are you a CB? Which is construction battalions. And I said, well, I have a marijuana paraphernalia charge. And, you know, all I could do is construction or be a cook. And um, so he started to get into, uh, is it Gary McGinnon, who uh, hacked into NASA? This was during the Iraq war, and he was from Scotland. So it was kind of like a current event. It was probably only a year ago. And he told me about him, and he said that, you know, he hacked into NASA, he hacked into the Navy, the Army. And in the Navy, he found a file called Project Solar Warden. And it had you know, different files on extraterrestrial officers with, uh, you know, ranks and social security numbers, uh, cigar shaped craft over the moon. And he said, it's all real. So the only reason they didn't extra, uh, charge him is an extra item is because, uh, he wouldn't be able to call witnesses and it would have blew the whole lid off solar warden. So they just kind of swept it under the rug. The war was happening at the time. And, uh, he, Basically, he told me that um, with my scores, I'd be able to become a pilot of a four kilometer long starship. And um, so I thought about it and I said to him, that machine I walked through, that scanner. And he said, yes. And I said, that could detect uh, my IQ and if I had any plots and anything like that. And he said, yes. And I said, well, my father died of a widow maker when I was young. You know, he had a piece of cholesterol in one of his heart arteries broke off and he died. I said, if we had technology like that, that would have saved his life. I said, why isn't that brought to the public? And I said, well, there has to be a side that wants to bring this to the public. And he said, you mean like a traitor? And I said, no, sir. I said, there just has to be a side. And he said, well, there is. And I said, well, if you can get me on that side, I'll do it. And we agreed. And I shook his hand. And I saluted him. And as he was walking away, he turned around. He said, well, one more thing, Mr. James. And he was calling me Mr. Too, which only officers in the Navy like call each other Mr. He said, one more thing, Mr. James, you're going to be escorted by a reptile and he's big. And I really didn't have any idea what he was talking about. So that was the end of that day. And then I was in the, we were in the barracks and we were playing the video game Halo. It was just like a group of us all playing Halo. And uh, one of the guys said, did you see the reptile today? And another guy said, yeah, he, he was big, walking around in the underground base. And uh, another one said, and he talked funny, too. And in my head, I was when I was kind of listening to him and waiting for the next game, but I was just thinking it was kind of like a monitor lizard, like a four-legged lizard, because I, I, I had no I, I didn't know anything like that. I didn't, I wasn't into things like that. And uh, I said, there's a, you know, there's reptiles underground that talk to you? And they said, yeah, yeah, you're, you're new here. But yeah, you'll see. I'm like, they just walk around the underground base and i said they walk around on all fours and they talk to you and they said no they walk upright like us they have you know hands and legs face and i kind of thought they were just messing with me because i was a new guy and even what, what the xo told me uh, none of this was really sinking in like like this kind of world it really wasn't i i didn't know how to wrap my head around it i guess you would say and then there was the next day because you know i volunteered for the program on a monday so then Friday is when I was going to actually join the program, you know, at another 004 a.m. watch. And uh, so this was probably the very next day, and we were playing Halo again in the barracks at night. And one of the guys said, yeah, man, I joined the secret space program, and I was in the mines of the moon, and they put these shot collars around you, and they worked you in groups. And if somebody in the group didn't work hard enough, they shock everybody. And they had all these brothels because your only motivation to work was sex because they didn't pay you. And uh, I said, well, the XO himself came up to me and told me I have 195 IQ and I would become a pilot of a four kilometer long starship. Did he say that to you? And he said, no, nah, man, because I thought maybe I would just wind up in the mines or something, whatever he was talking about. And you know, I thought it was just like a way to trick people. And he said, no, nobody came up to me. I just worked in the underground base and I volunteered for it. He said, you're going to be up there. They're going to take care of you. And then all of a sudden, like a feedback loop happened in the room. And a voice came on and it said something like, now hear this, now hear this. You are now in violations of section seven and eight of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. If you do not stop right now, you will face up to 10 years in prison and $100,000 in fine. 
that'll be all. And it went away. And I looked around and I was looking for a speaker, but there was no speaker. And I said, is there a speaker in here? And another one of the guys said, no, it's the technology they have. They don't need speakers. So, and they, and I tried, tried to keep on talking about it, but they said, you know, we should stop because they're listening now. And one of the guys came up to me in the barracks the next day and he said, Hey, did you hear that voice? And I said, yeah. And um, he said, you see those rectangular blocks on the radio tower by the underground base? And I said, yes. So that's the new technology they're using here, which is 5G. He said they can uh, create a microwave beam and they can go into a house and they can see everything, you know, hear everything, and they can talk to you if they want. So they don't have to, like, bug your house. They don't have to break into your house to bug it anymore. They can just do it in 5G towers. And uh, so then it was the night before, like a Thursday night. And I was in the TV room of the barracks watching TV. And the room right across the hall, the door was open. And it was one of the situations where it seemed like the person was talking to someone else, but it was almost like he wanted me to overhear him. Because I found out later, like, the command was basically trying to, like, acclimatize me, like, get me ready, because I didn't work in the underground base, kind of get me ready for what was going to happen. And he said, they're going to take you into a room, and they're going to strap you down to a chair. He said it's a density chamber. He said we're third density, but the ETs we work 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 with are fifth density. So you'll become stronger, faster. Your IQ will go up 200 points, and you'll become more of a collective. Like when you're in a group, you kind of become that group. And um, so I, you know, I, I just overheard something, but I remember it. So then I showed up for my watch the next day. I was in my you know dress or working blues, and. Uh, I had to sign like a stack of papers like that, like a, like a mortgage. And it was already X'd and everything, you know, and he was flipping the pages for me. And he, it was the same uh, petty office of the watch, the, the one before that with the scanner and everything. And, uh, you know, sign here, initial here. And I, at first I tried to read it. And uh, it's, it was saying things like, you know, like the consciousness of the first party now belongs to the second party. And I, it, I got kind of cold feet. And I, I, I said, like, I don't, I don't want to sign this because, you know, it, it, this, this the wording was it kind of freaked me out and he said you're already back there so just sign the papers so he's basically like telling me like i was already in the underground base being re age regressed and this was something that the X xo told me too that i forgot to put in was uh he said that the program he told me about the 20 year and back project solar warden he said you join the program you do 20 years we'll send you back in time 20 years age regress for 20 years wipe your mind and you wake up in bed like nothing happened that's kind of like how he explained it to me and um, so, yeah, it was like I was already back. Like, I, I was in a time loop. Like, I, I already come, came back. And so, uh, you know, I, I wound up signing the papers. He said, sit down. He got on the phone. He said, send them in. I waited about five minutes, and I was kind of daydreaming. And he pointed at that big window next to the sliding glass door, and he said, all right, go with him. And there was just like this nine and a half foot reptile, brown, dark brown, had ridges going down its head, almost like mohawks. Um, its mouth went straight across and up. It had like gold alligator eyes. And I stood up, you know, I stood up and I yelled, Jesus Christ. I said, he's not going to eat me, is he? And he said, he's stronger and faster than you. If he wanted to eat you, it he would have done it by now. So eventually the thing walked out of that room and then walked into the quarter deck and it was just huge. It was wearing like one of those tight blue suits you see, you always hear about. And uh, this was a different guard behind him. And there was like another guard standing behind him, like a, a young kid, skinny. And uh, so I got up and I started walking with it. We walked in the underground base. You take an elevator that takes you down. And uh, the guard kept on like butt stroking me in the back, like hitting me with the butt of his rifle, like in between the shoulder blades. And I, he did it several times. And I said, you know, I'm not looking around or anything, so please stop hitting me. And he did it again. And, you know, I, I had been to the range and I wasn't really afraid of weapons or anything. So I just turned around and I grabbed his rifle and I put my leg behind his leg, legs and I just threw him on the ground and knocked the wind out of him. And I held the rifle kind of like by the barrel over over top of him. And I said, if you hit me with this weapon one more time, I'm going to shove it up that side with us. And then I heard the reptile say, leave us. And, uh, the, you know, he, he looked at me, he got up, looked at me, looked at his weapon, looked at me, looked at his weapon. I just held it out and he grabbed it and he just turned around and walked away. 
And when I turned around, the reptile was just like right in front of me. And, you know, you know, he had all his muscles flexed and, you know, he was just peering down like over his, you know, chest muscles. I could see his eyes kind of peering down over him. And the first thing that came into my head was, I'm sorry for what you said. I'm sorry for what I said before. You're, you're much more civilized than him talking about, is he going to eat me? And they don't have any like muscles in their face. So they don't like furrow their brow or, you know, bare their teeth or anything like that. The only way you can tell they're annoyed with you is, they, you know, their eyes just get small. And when I said that, his eyes just opened up normal and he turned around and he said, follow me. And then we were gradually walking down hill. And there were things like bicycles leaning up against the wall and golf carts. I was kind of just looking around. And uh, eventually we got to like, you know, a catwalk, like three steps that went up to like a watertight door, you know, with the wheel on it and everything like that. And he walked in. And when I walked in, I saw this chair with the straps and everything. And we had something called the D.A.R.E. program when I was a kid. You know, Nancy Reagan and everything. She started it with Ronald Reagan. And uh, they brought um, a gas chamber, you know, in a trailer in our school, with, you know, the chair. They brought the chair in. And it really freaked me out and scared me as a kid. So whenever I saw this chair, I thought, like, this thing's trying to kill me. And I just tried to run. And it grabbed me and it threw me in the chair. It strapped me down. And in, in the process, I wound up um, poking it in the eye because it got really close to me. Because, you know, I was fighting to get away. And it just threw me back in the chair and I could feel like his fingers up here and palm here. That's how big it was. And uh, it kind of growled like a, like an alligator's like a mating call where you can't really hear it, but you can kind of feel the percussion in your chest, like the rumble. And as it got closer, you could hear like the actual rumble. And when he, he said, don't make me hit you again. And whenever he did that, I jammed my thumb in his eye and he leaned back and he just pressed against my chest until he collapsed my chest and pushed against my heart and I just passed out. And I woke up and I was completely strapped in and he was pushing like buttons or something, but I couldn't see what it was. He was doing something still inside the chamber and he went to walk out. Before he walked out, he said, I'm sorry, I have to do this to you. Is what he said. And then he, you know, tightened the door and it felt almost like a uh, out of body experience, I guess you would say. It was kind of like a uh, cold weightlessness and then peace it almost felt like you know like my soul was kind of coming out of my body and then I just kind of blacked out and I came to and when I came to the straps were already undone and there was a man who was actually a first class petty officer on the base and he was dressed like a Gestapo you know like his hair was slicked back with pomade it was shaved on the side and he was kind of gesturing like he was talking but he wasn't talking. And then the reptile's back was towards me and the reptile was doing the same thing. And I slid out of the chair. Like It was really weak. And I had like, I couldn't remember like who I was. Like I could still reason, but I, I couldn't remember my history. And uh, I said something like, can I go to bed now? And then I fell on my hands and knees and I was like swaying back and forth. And I saw boots come into my vision. And he said, I should have you executed for what you did to my man. Do you hear me? And then the reptile said, it doesn't matter. He doesn't remember. And I just fell over. And then I woke up and I was being carried by kind of like a duffel bag. I was under his arm and uh, with my head to the back. And I said something like, you know, I have to pee. He was like, right up. All my weight was right on my bladder. And I said, put me down. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pee on you. And he didn't listen. And I just passed out again. And then I saw a bright light. And I was told later that that was looking glass technology, which is like a technology where they can go anywhere in time and kind of uh, observe, or they can step through the looking glass. It's like a portal. And it was a portal taking me into the moon. And he laid me down on a medical bed, which is just, you know, I had railings, regular medical bed. And I saw one of the big, you know, surgery lights with like the LEDs all over it. And I heard ripping and tearing. And uh, it was a woman. She started putting like stickers on my chest. It was like a physical or something. And the reptile said he has to urinate. And I heard one long tear and uh, she put a catheter in me. And I looked over and it was actually a woman that worked on the base who was an IT, like computer tech. But uh, I guess she volunteered for the program and she was a nurse in the moon now. And, um, you know, I was really out of it and woozy and I was kind of ignorance is bliss. And I looked, I felt almost like drunk. And 5 density, 5D is like, I don't know, colors become more vibrant, sounds. You could go up and down your timeline without even realizing you're doing it kind of thing. You, see, you kind of go five years into your future and then come back. It's kind of, it's a complete 
different of reality. It's difference in reality compared to what, the way we are now. And uh, you know, I, I asked her. I said, I, "Well, I said you're pretty. I said, can you can I hold your hand?" And she, she eventually gave me her hand. I just fell asleep. And I woke up the next day, and I was sitting down, and I was by myself. And all of a sudden, she walks in and she puts her bag down, and she got out like a smart glass pad, which is what the uh, smartphone is based off of, which is like a clear kind of rectangular pad, and uh, and images were on it, and she was able to kind of put her hand in the image and pull them out, almost like a hologram, and it was like a image of a humanoid body, and she could put her finger in it and turn it around and look at it, put her hand in it and open it up, and she was looking at my brain, you know, my circulatory system, making sure I was healthy, and then she was going to leave for the day, and you know, I stood right in her, her path and I said, you know, don't leave me. I don't want to be in this room by myself again. And she said, don't worry, I'll be back next day. And I took her hand and I said, I don't know what to do or say. All I know is I don't want you to leave me. And she liked that. So she took my hand and took me out of the room. And we were kind of like, it looked like a courtyard of a condominium. Um, there was like a train going behind us. It looked like changing of the shift. It was like men going to work. Uh, and there were like five levels on this condominium, like this courtyard, this kind of five or six levels of this, you know, it looked like a condo. And there were women with like babies waving and stuff. And there were these four big lifts in the middle of it. And they had no railing or anything. So she took me one of these lifts and it lifted us up and took her, took us directly to her room. And uh, there was a woman standing on the sidewalk of this top floor and she had a baby and there was no railing on the sidewalk. And I said, aren't you afraid you're going to fall off? And she said, oh, no, you can't fall off, fall off. And she just walked out. And she was just on like an invisible field. She, she goes, every level has one. And you can walk all the way to the very end. She said, uh, the children play on it. They're not supposed to, but they do. So eventually we went into a room. And it was just like Spartan. It was just like a couch, a coffee table, a bar, a bathroom area, you know, kitchen area, bedroom. She took me to her bedroom and we started to kiss. And then she, uh, she said, wait, what's your name? And I said, I don't remember. And she said, think, everybody remembers their name. And I thought about it and I said, Daryl. And then we wound up having sex and I dozed off. And then all of a sudden I was back in England. It was just like that. It was like that quick. And I remember I stood up and I was like, I was with a woman. Like, what happened to me? I was, you know, what happened? And my uniform was laid out like in front of me on the chair. It was really something I wouldn't, wouldn't do, you know, it was just like my shirt, my pants, and my shoes were tucked underneath it. And I was still wearing my shirt and I still had my socks on. And uh, I got, you know, I took my shirt off and I got up and I was really big, like tone. I was very muscular. I was pretty big already, but it, like I was in the military in my twenties, but you know, I was very big and I kind of put my hand on my chest and I had burnt stubble on my, on my, in my hair. And I ran my hand across my hair and I had burnt stubble. And I looked at my feet and I had clay on the tops of my feet. And uh, I walked out. One of the guys was just waiting for me. And he said, uh, congratulations, you made it. And I said, what? He said, 20 years is a long time. A lot of people don't make it back. And I didn't know what he was, I had no memory. I didn't know what he was talking about. And uh, one time I went to the bar. There was a bar on base. And there were all these, always these guys in there. And when I walked in, one of them said, uh, hey, it's the king of the Tigetans, he goes, hey, Aquino f you up, man. He said, he, he had me doing all kinds of stuff to you. He said, you don't remember any of that? And I said, no. And he said, yeah, you're calling yourself the king. And uh, I said, what's a Tigetan? He's like, you ever heard of Pleiadian? And I said, yeah. He's like, well, he said, have you ever heard of Billy Meyer? And I said, no, I've never heard of him before. And he's like, well, you should look him up. Like, you know, he talked a lot about him. And then things like that would happen on the base, you know, just people would say things to me or ask me things. And I remember one time one of the one of the guys came up to me and said, you know, Johnson told him there's a technology that can pull a consciousness out of a body, but they can't do it when they're too young because the body's mostly sedentary. It's used like a vessel almost. And he said that's what happened to Aquino, you know, that his consciousness was pulled out and something else was kind of like controlling his body. And I said, well, what's controlling him? And he said he didn't know. And uh, so eventually I, you know, was getting out of the command. I, I didn't want to, you know, I, I was going through like a really horrible depression. I was drinking a lot and I was getting into trouble. And it was like something was wrong. I, 
I, I never took like, you know, antidepressant medication or anything like that. It was very, you know, I was having a hard time. And uh, when you're getting out of the military, you get to see the master chief of the base, you get to see the executive officer, and you get to see the commanding officer. A tradition that they do where you can say whatever you want, you know, you could call him a jerk or whatever, but you can't threaten him, you can't break the law, but it's just like this thing you can do. And uh, saw the master chief and didn't say much. And then when I came into the executive officer's uh, room, he stood up and he looked very sad and then he just appeared at the end of his desk. And I, I remember I thought like, did I just have a stroke? And then all of a sudden he just appeared right in front of me. And I took a step back and in my head, I heard him say, can you hear what I'm saying to you? And I said, yes, but it's kind of like they want you to make a physical gesture because you, so you realize it's not just the voice in your head, it's real. And he said it again, can you hear what I'm saying to you? And I nodded my head and under my breath, I said, yes. And he said, what do you remember? And I, I said, uh, I remember a woman sitting down and she had long silver hair, big blue eyes, big cheekbones. Um, she had a baby on her lap. I kissed the baby on the head and then I kissed her. She, he said, that was mother. He said, you had a son with her. And I said, I have a son. And he said, you have dozens of sons and hundreds of daughters. I just kind of said, what? Like, what are you talking about? And he just kind of like told me about this world or this life that I didn't know I had. And he said something happened. Something went wrong in the density chamber. He said, you weren't put back properly in the fifth or third density. He said, uh, you still have your memories. He told me that uh, a majority of people who still have memories of the 20 year and back commit suicide within the first six months. And he said, you have to go back. I, I didn't want to go back and he was kind of looking down my timeline, I guess. He told me he was from the year 2580. He said that, uh, you think I look, I look like Mike Pence? He said, you're right. And I said, who's Mike Pence? Because I didn't know who he was at the time. And he said, he's a politician and becomes president. He said, he's no good, though. And he explained to me that they have black hair, usually brown eyes, sometimes blue or green. Uh, their hair begins to salt and pepper at 50, turns pure white by 60. Their uh, eyebrows turn white at 70, and their average life expectancy is 110. And I said, well, that's horrible. I said, like in Star Trek, people live to 120. And he said, we didn't reach our true potential. And he said, the off-world Germans live over 800 years. He said, that, that's our true potential. We should live eight, around 800 years. And then he started telling me, uh, I, I said, you know, I, I kind of got my memories back. As he was just talking to me, it was almost like it was in the back of my mind, but I didn't know why I didn't think about it. And there were different people that I could just tell didn't like me. And I said, was that first class petty officer, the one I saw dressed like a Gestapo? I said, he's an off world jerk, right? He said, yes. And he, he explained to me that the uh, master chief of the base was um, the S3, who's fourth in, fourth in command, a lieutenant. He was an off world German. The doctor was an off world German. And then we had like a senior chief that wore glasses and a mustache that was one. And uh, he explained to me that we actually lost World War II. And that, uh, you know, the Germans were like channeling ETs uh, that told them to go to Antarctica and dig up all this uh, technology. And they took it all to South America and reverse engineered it and figured out how it worked, how it happened. So these guys, they, they really weren't infiltrators. They were spies. It was just like, you know, these off-world Germans is what the military calls them. You know, they're, you know, we're kind of under their control, the United States. And um, yeah, eventually, you know, he, he realized that I wasn't gonna go back into the chair. He kept on trying to convince me and I wasn't gonna go back. And that was pretty much the end of, of I, he, he tried to reach me one more time through the 5G technology, like the Friday before I was um, leaving the Navy, you know, going to Virginia to process out. And uh, I said, no, no again. When you first saw the gray for the first time, were you afraid or did you have any emotion? Oh, I was terrified. Yeah. Like I, I thought like, you know, I, I, like I said, I didn't know if it was going to be like an, I even asked the guy, does it care if I look at it? You know, because I thought like if it was like a wild animal, would it attack me if I locked eyes with it for too long or anything like, you know, cause I had no idea what it was. I'd seen it like on covers of books before, like things that look like that, but I, I really didn't know. What did the voice of the reptilian sound like? It was kind of like deeper than any man could be, but then the last word 
or syllable, it kind of had to push out and it became like higher pitch. So when it said like, leave us, it was kind of like, leave us. It was kind of like that. Yeah. Did it have any type of accent? I mean, it didn't talk. It, it was grumbly and, and it didn't talk very much. It just seemed like language was kind of foreign to it. And I, I remember um, when it was rustling me down into the chair, I got a good look at its thumb, like more detail about it. And its nails were kind of like ours in the beginning. You know, they were black, like pure black. But then they came out a little bit and kind of rolled into each other, like either each side and created like long needles, like long black needles. The woman that you were with on the other side that had silver hair, what race of being was she? Yeah, I, I, I asked them, I said, you know, because I, I did watch the Billy Meyer and I found out about Pleiadians and stuff like that. And I, I said that to him. I said, you mean like the Pleiadians? And he said, they, we call them Nordics. And I said, what do they call themselves? And he said, I get it. And yeah, they get older. He told me they live over 3,000 years. He said once they get to around 2,000 years, their bones begin to grow again. But their skin and their organs don't. So they get very like long and tall and thin. So she was probably around seven feet tall, what I remember of her. Because she was very like over 3,000 years. Were they having you mate with these beings so they could create human Tigetan? Hybrids? Yes. Um, yeah, he told me like I had around 800 something children in the end. And I asked him why they liked me so much. And he said, because you can speak to the children. And I said, what do you mean? And he said that the children have a type of pig Latin that they speak, that they grow out of when they're about six, where it's almost like tel uh, telepathy. It's, they call it communicating, the, the ETs. But like communicating is almost 50% words and 50% emotion. But with the children, it's more like 80% emotion and 20% words. And I asked him, I said, like, what does it sound like? And he said, it, it sounds like babble, like baby babble with a word here and there. And I said, we'll do it. And he, he kind of like, you know, first we went to the apakataka and then over to the adatata. And he said it was just something I knew. I, 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 could, I could tell what they were saying. And he called me something... I was a telepathic empath is what he said, which means I didn't need to know the language of a people or their culture or anything like that. I could just tell what they were saying. So I was very rare and useful in that sense, almost like a universal translator for them. And uh, yeah, they just wanted that in their genetics as well. And it was something about third and fourth density beings. See, fifth density beings is uh, I'm naive. And it was like a way also to, uh, so they wouldn't be as naive. They're kind of like a trusting people. They just believe in your, your word. And I remember we were talking about Aquino for a while because I could remember him while I was in the office with him. And uh, Aquino is like, like I said before, this is late, way later on in the end of the story, but I asked him like where he, like what he was and what he was from. He was like a black reptile with fangs. He kind of had gold eyes on the side, kind of a snout. He was wearing like a red robe and a red hood. And uh, he said he was once worshipped in ancient Egypt. He was like the, the, the serpent god of, of ancient Egypt. And uh, we were talking about him in the office. And, he, and Robert got kind of almost spooked. And he said, we should stop talking about Aquino now. And I said, why? And he said, uh, Aquino is fourth density. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, fourth density is astral plane, spirit world. He said, if we talk about him too much, we can conjure him. And I said, we could conjure him? Like, I was like, really? And he said, yeah, like, that's like how their reality works. And he said he could be in this room right now, and we, we wouldn't even know it. Do you have all your memories of being there for 20 years or a certain percentage? Certain percentage. He, he told me a lot, and that was a big reason why I remember. Um, you know, I think he was like telling me, the reason he was telling me these things is because he realized I wasn't going to go back and get my mind rewiped. And he wanted me to know that this wasn't just like something I was making up. This wasn't just something, you know, happening in my mind, you know? So I think he was telling me everything to save my sanity, but yeah. So he told me you're going to remember in real time is how he put it. So as the, mem as the me up there in the program creates new memories, I remember them down there. I can remember uh, down here, I can remember the beginning and the end. But it was something like I had a blanket in the middle. Like I couldn't remember the middle. And uh, so 
when I went to the program, you know, after I worked in the mines of the moon, and this was something else he told me, I wanted like a timeline. Like I wanted to kind of figure out where I was and how long I was there. I wanted to make sense out of it. And I said, I remember being in mines. I said, was that in earth? He said, that was in the moon. And I said, I was in the moon. He said, yes. I said, how long? He said, three months. And then he said, after that, I was in the dark fleet, like Nachtwaffen, like awful German kind of mercenaries that worked for the Draconian Empire. And uh, he said, I was in the dark fleet for two years. And then he said, the rest of the time I was with them. Like, But it was kind of like a joint task force between Solar Warden and like the Pleiadians. It was like, a, like they were working together. And we were almost kind of like customs, I guess you would say, of Earth. He said uh, the the moon was uh, in the future. He said it was freed. You know, there was like a kind of a slavery in the going on in the moon. That was freed. Um, he said that the Earth is on lockdown. Like nothing's allowed in and out without Solar Warden's permission kind of thing. Like it's no ships are allowed in or out on Earth. It's just like in a lockdown period. And um, so in the mines... In the moon, it was like, that's exactly what we we're doing. It was just kind of like long bits, like you see with like oil and stuff like that. I don't remember exactly what we were mining. It was very dusty and cold. Um, there were brothels there and all that stuff. And this woman who was the nurse, who was the, the IT and things like that on the base, I became, she became kind of like my girlfriend when I was there. And uh, then after that, I remember Robert came up. And, you know, he, he seemed like they seemed like they wanted to keep people together who were in the command and the base to kind of keep track of them, if that makes sense. And Robert showed up one time and I didn't know who he was. And he talked to one of the German officers and the German officer held like a device in front of me and then started yelling at like the, the German who was the first class petty officer. He was giving me a hard time. The one that said I should have him executed for what my man. And uh, I was getting beaten a lot and stuff. He was like giving people extra you had almost like a commissary kind of thing, payment, where you could buy things like chocolate and beer and things like that. So they gave you like a little bit of money. And uh, so they had this German officer. He went up to this other one and started yelling at him. And then uh, he came up to me and he said, you're coming with me now. And I, I went with him. Uh, I got processed into the dark fleet. They put like a, strapped me down to a table. And a, like a guy, like in a doctor's outfit, he showed me a syringe and he said, this is your implant. I'm going to put it into your brain. They put like a syringe, like directly through my skull and left an implant there. And then I, the table flipped over and they gave me almost like a spinal tap. And uh, I felt something cold. And I think that was the tech they were putting into my body. Um, people call it like black goo and stuff like that. They put almost like a technology into you. It makes you stronger, faster, smarter. But it also kind of takes away uh, your ability to say no and you become almost like a like a board kind of thing like a you, like a high you know what I mean when you're in the dark fleet you really don't have your own kind of uh, ability to kind of say no like it's it's so because you have to do pretty bad stuff and uh, I was in Mars for a long time in the dark fleet we we're mostly capturing like uh mantises they call them they look like they look almost like praying mantises and they're really good with uh, DNA manipulation and uh, so the reptile is one of them for DNA manipulation, like to tell them more about their studies with DNA manipulation. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I was getting everything they wanted. I was, you know, capturing all the mantises they wanted. Sometimes we'd get into skirmishes with reptiles. There was like a reptile species that lived on, on Mars. Um, sometimes the mantises and reptiles would band together and fight us. I remember Robert told me, he said, you died the third day you were on Mars when he was, he was talking to me. And uh, I remember now we, we were overrun by reptiles and I just saw like a mouth go over my, my face and everything went black. And he said that you're a clone. It was like one of the ways he was trying to get me to go back into the chair. He, he was like kind of telling me how things were. It kind of freaked me out to get me to get my mind wiped. And I, I kind of had a panic a, a attack almost because, you know, I seen sci-fi movies and I said well I'm a clone I said what's the point of me like living I'm, I'm not even like the real Daryl I just have memories of him and he said you don't understand he said they're able to salvage your consciousness and I said well what does that mean he said your soul if that makes you feel any better he said they, they made an exact replica of your body in every way and just put your soul back into it he said, that's the part that makes you you is your your soul your consciousness and um 
Yeah, so I was getting everything. I was capturing all the advances they wanted. And I remember I went into like a room of the reptiles and the reptiles, there was like a, they called them the master. There was like a head reptile and he had like three others with him. And it seemed like the reptiles were kind of over, you know, in command of the, the off-world Germans. And basically said to me that, you know, everything you did, you know, we're, we're, you're doing everything we tell you to do. You're, you're getting everything we want. And uh, we'll tell them to be easy on you when you go back to Earth. And then there was like a different high-ranking German there that day. And they took me into like a separate room. And he told me that the reptiles are lying to you. They're not going to be easy on you. He said, your only living relatives are your mother and your sister. We'd like you to join the Dark Fleet, like, full time. And, you know, to escape death, like, you know. But, so I thought about it, and I said, you know, I, I asked him if I get permission to speak freely, sir. And he said, granted. And I said, uh, are there horses on your world? And he said, yes, I have several horses. And um, I said, I want what you want. And he said, what do you mean? You want to be an officer? And I said, well, if I earned that, then yes, but I want what you want. Uh, I want to be able to own land. I want to have a German wife and I want to have German children with her. I basically told him I wanted citizenship, like full citizenship, if I was going to do this. So they discussed it. And then the next day they came back and they said, you know, you've been approved. I went on their world. And I remember Robert asked me, he's like, what was it like? What was the German world like? And he said, they're very uh, secretive. He had never been there. And I thought about it and I said, it was like the 40s. He said, what do you mean? I, I said, men wear uh, suits and fedoras and women wear dresses and pillbox hats. And uh, they had like a very advanced uh, like public transit kind of thing where they had like trams, but they also had almost like a sidewalk where it was like sidewalks that would kind of slowly speed you up and then you hit like a, a main one and you were on this main sidewalk. So you could kind of go on like little branching paths and it would take you into like a main kind of conveyor belt, like a fast movie, like 50, 60 mile an hour, like conveyor belt. And uh, I met a woman named Helen there and I was engaged to marry her and then i had to go back on the ship and i was kind of wearing their same uniforms their uniforms are almost like a gestapo uniform like a black kind of uniform like what the germans wore in world war ii and uh on the space station we went to a space station and i remember the first officer was good friends with me and the first officer on the ship was actually the s3 in england and the command i was in the navy so it was like they were these Germans were actually going back and forth from Earth to their ships and things like that, in the, you know, and while this is happening. And uh, we went to, to this kind of like a space station almost thing, where it was almost like a big rectangular block. There were windows in the front, like the two sides were just nothing but seemed like glass, transparent aluminum, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And in the back, there were levels. And uh, a lot of trade went on. A lot of things were like different factions that were war warring and things like that. We're discussing in terms of peace or maybe the, you know, acts of war and things like that. That's what kind of happened here. It was almost like a UN, like a, like a way to, for different beings to come together who are at war, or, you know, to, to just discuss peace and everything. And uh, when I was there, I saw, like, I only see like reptiles and greys and things like that. But when I was there, I saw all these different species. I saw like the feline, I saw like the canine, I saw like uh, Arcturians, which are, they have like the deep blue sapphire skin, big black eyes, and their pupils look almost like a swirling blue galaxy, kind of. So I saw these different beings walking around. And a lot of it was small, too, like kind of zipping around, like little two foot, three foot beings, sometimes shorter. And there's almost like an unspoken rule where the taller beings walk very slow, and all these littler ones were kind of like zipping around everywhere. And, um, a man and a woman came up, you know, just blonde hair, blue eyes, like eyes a bit bigger than ours, but that was about it. And the woman said something to the the head reptile, like, the cargo rightfully belongs to us. You know, it does. You took it from us. You know, you need to give it back. And then the reptile replied something like, since we invested so much time and in training into the cargo, it rightfully belongs to us now. And then the man came up and he had a smart glass pad and he basically showed it him like a, like an article. And he said, you know, you are in violations of this treaty. If you don't give the cargo to us immediately, it will be considered an act of war. 
So the reptile read it all and he threw his hands up in the air and he walked away. And then the woman came up to me and said, you're coming with us now. And so I really wasn't like a full German yet. I really had no say so. I was just kind of like a, you know, a select, I guess you'd call me. And uh, so I went with them and their ship was kind of like, like the Billy Meyer. It was like a polished metal, like saucer kind of ship. And because they had like a hangar area in this place. And when I, w I went to the back of the ship and it looked like poured metal, it was just like one long booth that kind of went around. And I sat down and then they were in the front at first and I was by myself. And then after a while they came back and they uh, were looking at each other and I heard her say, he looks disturbed. And the man said, wouldn't you be if you had to live with them? And uh, I turned around, and I looked at them and they both looked at me at the same time. It was kind of eerie. Like they both looked at me and their heads cocked towards each other at the same time when they looked at me. So I turned around really quickly and he, then he walked up to me and kneeled down in front of me and he said, can you hear what I'm saying to you? And uh, I said, yes. And just like before with Robert, he said it again, can you hear what I'm saying to you? And I nodded my head. And then they, it, there's almost like a way you could talk telepathically where if you focus in on the person, you can have a private conversation. So they, they did that and they were, they were just focusing in on, on each other and I couldn't hear what they were saying. And then eventually, yeah, I got processed into like Solar Warden working with them and everything like that. And I remember I saw Mother for the first time. And Mother's name was Shara Yi, and that was her name. And uh, I was still in like my black uniform, and they were wearing like the blue, you know, tight suits. And she was wearing more like it looked like a like a white lab coat almost that kind of dragged behind her a little bit with like a silver dress underneath it. And she stepped right in front of me and she said out loud, she said, your name is Daryl. And I said, who told you that? And she said, nobody, I plucked it from your mind. So there's almost like a way where they can kind of go into people's minds and kind of figure things out and discover things about these people. And then she just like stepped aside and walked away. And I was mostly, like I said, a pilot. And Robert told me that the name of the ship was the USSS, like the extra S's were for secret space, Nimitz. So the name of the ship was Nimitz. He said, but you were the pilot, so you get you were able to nickname the ship, and I nicknamed the ship Mama Bear. And it was actually, it had a female, like, Pleiadian soul in it that volunteered herself. All of the reptilian technology that I used, like the suits, the weapons, all that stuff, it actually had, like, a soul kind of trapped in it. And the more positive ETs, they find that inhumane, but for their larger tech, like these four kilometer long ships, it does need like artificial intelligence and it does need like a consciousness put into the ship. And uh, there were two black panels like in front of me when I would pilot it and I put my palms on the panels and I would just close my eyes and I'd clear my thoughts. And I'd, I then I would hear a voice in my head say, good morning, Daryl, and I'd say, good morning, Mama Bear. And that's how I knew I had a telepathic link with the ship. Um, there was also like a swing arm kind of smart glass pad, like a very big one. It, it was on a swing arm that you pull it towards you, and it was used for things like docking and departing and things like that. You would dock almost almost like in these space stations because these things were too big to land on any any world. But you would just kind of dock, and then they would take smaller craft, and that's how you land on the world while these huge ships were kind of right outside. Um, there was a co-pilot. Uh, he was like a, a Nordic Pleiadian. Um, he piloted it with me. I was living with all three of them in the beginning. The pilot, her, um, I remember her name was like uh, Swaru, is what Robert told me. And uh, there was another woman I knew. She was half human. She, I think her father was like from Sweden or Norway or something like that. And uh, her name was uh, Leah. And uh, so we were all living together. And it, it was well, the reason they did that is because when you live with someone, you create a stronger telepathic link. And they wanted all three of us to have a very strong telepathic link because you're constantly interacting and talking with them. But yeah, the women, they go through a like a 10 month bonding process with their baby after they're born. Like you can't get next to them, you can't get near them. They're just alone by themselves with the babies. And uh, the men rut, like the male equivalent of going in the heat for every six months for about two weeks. It's like a, the men usually have more than one wife. And when I was on their world, it was more like, the ratio is probably 30 to 1, 30 women to every one man is how it was on the world. And, 
yeah, I eventually went to their world. I got to see that. I, Robert told me I had been to more, more worlds than he had. And he had been in, he, he, you know, he said he was from the year 2580. Uh, he'd been age regressed 17 or 18 times. Uh, he said he was around, I don't know, like 300 or something like that, years old. Um, he said age regression, they can do it twice, which is 20 years every time, so a total of 40 years. But it, after that, it can become uh, psychological. It can give you psychological damage. And I asked them, like, you know, you've been age regressed 17, 18 times. I said, um, you know, how often do you get psyche eval? And he said every two weeks, every payday on the 1st and the 15th. And uh, I, I went out to their world. It looked kind of like, it was like a temperate climate. It looked like Norway or like the Rocky Mountains. It was mountainous. They had lakes, they had rivers, pines, things like that. Different kinds of animals. I remember I saw like something that looked similar to a deer or a buck, but it had like way more antlers, like way more points. It had like a lot of like points on it. And uh, yeah, I, I was teaching them things. I played music the entire time. These all ETs seem to be fascinated by our art. That was something I learned. Uh, whether it's classical paintings, they like they collect things like that. Um, whether it's classical music, I remember the first time I played music in front of like the the Pleiadians. Um, they were just like wide eyed, and they're, they they kind of do this thing where they get their eyes become wide and they drop their mouth open and they just kind of cock their head and they're just fascinated by it. Um, I began teaching you know children the music and things like that. Um, we started playing music on their world, things like that, different classical, even like things like rock and everything like that. And they really enjoyed it. I started teaching them our sport. And then uh, eventually it just got to the point where I had to go back home. And Robert was there a lot. He, he like, you know, I remember one time he came to their world and he had black hair again because he had been age regressed again. And I, I said, sir, you look so young. And he was like, yeah, I just got age. He said, and then he said, you didn't age at all. Like I, he hadn't seen me in like 10 years. And that was something else he said. He said, he said that uh, I age like them. He said, they still think to be, be age regressed every now and again. But uh, he, he told me that I age slower like them. Like I didn't need to be age regressed when I came back. And uh, so, yeah, eventually I, I had to go back. And eventually, I started remembering stuff. Because like I said, when you get pushed back down to the third density, you go through a temporary amnesia. So I didn't know, you know, what was happening. I had no memory of the program and, you know, coming to the base. And I slowly started getting my memories back. And I told him I remembered now. And uh, he said, what do you remember? And I, there was a woman there that I called the goth. It was on the base. She was U.S. Navy. And then I saw the goon, the guy called the goon, who the one that was in the bar on base. And uh, they were in black robes, you know, like kind of looking like a satanic person. And I, I told the keynote, I remember now, I said that I was the king of the Tigetans and you have, the, uh, you have committed an act of war. And it was almost like another reason they may be the king. It was only temporary and it was like a way to get, because the king gets like over 200 princesses, you know, and uh, it was like a way for my, DNA to get into them. They, they they wanted that into their DNA, you know, that I was an empathic telepath. They wanted to be less naive. They've been around for so long. They're kind of like, their gene pool is kind of stagnant. And so when they do find people, that, the outsiders they can bring in, that they do it to, to help out their uh, gene pool as well. And that was one another reason they made me a king was because they realized it would save my life. And then after that, like, Aquino let me go. And um, I was age regressed. And put back into bed and something else you know near the end when I was in the barracks this is kind of a strange story but when I was in the barracks and I'd already come back from the program I didn't remember I was watching like action movies with this English guy one time that was there and we were watching Die Hard or something and he was like on the third or fourth floor of the barracks and he all of a sudden he said look and we looked I looked out the window and walking down the road there was a guy in a black like uh jog suit with a hood on and black gloves and black sneakers and he had what looked like a body that was wrapped up in like a, a wool military blanket like a dark gray wool military blanket over his shoulder and I thought it was like a dead body and I, I said should we help him and he looked at me and he said no we can't help him now it's too late for him like he's made his decision so that was like somebody coming back from the program that joined the program and I guess in the middle of like at two in the morning they just wrap you up in the blanket and then take you back to your room at night since you've been back and 
left the military. Do you ever see UFOs in the sky or anything like that? I have no contact. I, I really don't have any kind of a visual sightings like that. I sometimes think I'm talking to them, but I'm not 100%. I second guess myself. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I really don't have any contact like that. And something else I'd like to put in was, was uh, when I was speaking to the XO, Robert, he told me that, you know, things are going to get a lot better. He told me about all these different horrible things that were going to happen, you know, that we're all going through right now. But he said it has to be that way because there's something called DNA memory. And it's only tri triggered by a traumatic event. So there has to be like a, a series of like traumatic events that happen to people. And it carries on through like your children's children. Like it's kind of like a in subconsciously into the, the minds of like the future. And it'll ensure that it won't happen again. But he asked me where I thought all the world's gold was. And at the time I was living in England. So I, I said, you know, Bank of England, Bank of London. And he said, no, it's in the catacombs of the Vatican. He said, we're getting it all out. He said that uh, before Caesar burned the Library of Alexandria, he took out all the, all the scrolls and all the books, and it's all in the catacombs of the uh, Vatican. History's a lie. Pretty much he told me like everything that we're taught is like, a complete lie, but th that'll all be released to the public, like our, our true history. He told me we're descendants of Atlanteans, like that was real. And yeah, so I mean, there's good hope for the future, I would say. And I think we're going through the birth pains of a new world right now. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Sure. Yeah. My website is DarylDJames.com. D-A-R-Y-L. D is in Delta. James.com. And uh, my email is there and everything else. And I'm in the midst of working on a book. Any idea when that will be finished? Uh, not, not right now. You know, probably, hopefully next year. Yeah, it's difficult because uh, painful memories and, you know, there are times where I feel like the, 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 the worst parts are what people would feel the worst parts are the easier parts. For myself, it's, you know, my family, you know, I, I, I remember them. It's difficult. Like, I can't remember all their na names and faces, but I just remember scenarios, situations, playing with kids, playing with my kids, you know, meeting pe new people, talking to them, you know, interacting with them. So that is more of a difficult thing for me than the actual painful parts. But yeah, I have to take breaks. Daryl, before we finish up, can you leave us with a positive message? I mean, the positive message, message is what, as far as what, you know, Robert told me, he said the, the original timeline where he came from, you know, was horrible, was bad. So they had to go back in time and kind of fix the timeline. But he said it's so much better now. And he said the economy is going to be so much better. And we are going to rely off a gold-based money system for a long time. We're still not ready to go completely, you know, socialist, free, everything, more of a higher density ET kind of civilization because we're just not ready for that yet. So we are going to have like a gold-backed currency. Money's going to work for you. You're not going to work for money anymore. Thank you for being my guest. I appreciate you and I wish you a great rest of your weekend. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.